Brogan. I'm with um, Penn Libraries. I have responsibility for our information resource budget. Um, I also have the pleasure of oversight for area studies programs. So um, our international collecting, mainly in non-Western languages. Um, and in addition, I um, guide our scholarly communications program. Thank you. And we run an institutional repository for open access uh, to scholarship produced at Penn. Um, yes, come on in. Come on in. Let's see. Just to um, frame the discussion, I'm going to make a few comments and then briefly introduce the, the speakers and let um, each of them uh, have their say. So um, information resources and the production of knowledge are key ingredients of social and economic development in contemporary societies. Access to information is critical to everyone involved in research, innovation, and creativity. And the interplay of these practices, typically in the form of scholarly communication, leads to the creation and the recreation of knowledge. Thus, quality teaching, learning, and research all depend on access to scholarly communication in its various dimensions. Nevertheless, in the contemporary world, access to scholarly communication and quality information resources remains a major challenge to a large segment of society for a variety of reasons. The multilingual nature of created knowledge, intellectual property laws, poor access to technology, and the increasing costs of access figure among the daunting challenges that hinder universal access to information. So our panel this morning will examine um, some exemplary initiatives that promote capacity building by strengthening the infrastructure of research and public libraries in lower income countries, train scholars in critical digital information competencies and authorship skills, and expand access to content um, across cutting edge published research literature thereby making the scientific community better able to adapt, innovate, and create solutions that are relevant to the local context. Um, MOOCs add a, a new dimension that I think is, is challenging um, to publishers and cre creators of, of uh, scholarly information. And so we will be um, projecting into the future and what kind of impact this may have. So we have three speakers. You have their their bios. And by the way, there I don't know. Just a few copies here. If anyone, I better keep oh, my nice. pink sheet. Uh -oh. Yes, to warn us, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, to, to warn you. Um, but Kim Parker will speak first. She's with the World Health Organization and coordinates um, a program related to research health information. Um, she will be followed by Mary Oates, who's the director of the Mann Library at Cornell University, which specializes in agriculture development and life sciences. And um, third, Rob Cronin, who is vice president at IREX and has more than 20 years experience um, in development. He is also the director of the Collaborative Technology Center for IREX. So we will start with Kim. Thank you. So I'm glad to see that we have such a full house today. <laughs> and by the way, we need to, yeah, we have no mic, so if you can't hear, just yeah, just hand. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, it's always good to have a nice select group of people because that means they really want to be here. I want to talk to you a little bit about the Research for Life initiative itself, just to give you the background before I go into then the connection between that access to information and MOOCs in the developing world. So for those of you who already know what, about Research for Life or the Henari Agora Awari RD program, you can go to sleep for about three minutes and then wake up again. Um, so what is Research for Life? It aims to reduce the knowledge gap um, between the global north and south, and it does so by providing access to key scientific publications and when we say that, we actually are talking about over 40,000 books and journals in online form. And the partners involved are four United Nations entities, a couple of U.S. universities, and then the key publisher partners, in this case over 175. So, 
What does it mean when we say we're trying to provide this access in the developing world? And it helps for those who may not be as familiar with information access in the developing world to start from an understanding of what existed before Research for Life entered the picture. We did some surveys, and most institutions who were signing up for Hinari originally had three journal subscriptions in their institution. So what this means in terms of this picture is if you imagine an issue of a journal, it's about that much. And if you stack three on top of each other and you put them next to a standing person, they're just a little line. If you then put together all the journals that are available through our programs now and you stack them up, they form the height of the Jet d'eau fountain in Geneva. <laughs> so we are talking about a significant amount of information and that doesn't even, even include the books because it's about Overall, in Research for Life, 15,000 journals, 25,000 books. Um, Hanari has 14,000, which is where the number comes from on this slide. And if you were to stack the books up, um, I haven't actually made that calculation. I have to figure out how tall they reach. What is the average height of a book? Does anyone know? <laughs> Thousand it's a medical textbook. Okay, well, average, <laughs> average, 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 average. Please. Yeah. So who can access the Research for Life content? Well, we've got institutions in 71 of the lowest income countries of the world which have access for free to the book and journal content via Hanari and the other programs in Research for Life. We also have another 45 countries on top of that where the institutions pay $1,500, and you can imagine this is millions of dollars of worth of content. So when you think of it in those terms, $1,500 isn't that much. For a subscription, it becomes an effective discount of almost 100%. This is the map of the world where the content is accessible, um, and it's differentiating. The blue is where it's free, and the yellow-orange is where it is costing $1,500 per institution. So this is more or less the low middle income countries of the world, the least developed countries of the world, however you want to think of it. Now when we all got started back in 2001, 2002, this was what the differentiation between low income and higher income countries looked like as calibrated by the World Bank. And back then they were calibrating by GNP per capita, now they calibrate by GNI per capita, but it's pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of the countries of the world were the ones with the least amount of income and <coughs> simply couldn't afford the access to the scientific publications that they needed to do their own research, to do their own education properly, to have the students actually become valuable workers. All the things that we're talking about in MOOCs for development in this conference was also an issue for us as we were thinking about access to information that could prime that pump. So what are our target audiences? Our target audiences are research and teaching universities, national research institutes, government offices, that's the ministries and all of the departments, etc., and governments. Publicly funded and not-for-profit agencies, that includes the local NGOs, so the tiny little civil society organizations that are starting up and trying to actually make a difference and actually base what they're trying to do on evidence, that includes them, and it includes the national libraries. So, I mentioned this before, but I want to put it in slightly different terms. In 2002, when we were getting started, there were three subscriptions to journals on average in our institutions. The reason why average cost of a medical journal throughout the 2000s, and it's only increased, as you'll see, the average cost of a medical journal in 2012 was $1,700. It's, it's not a hugely different picture if you're thinking about oh, extremely expensive materials if you're looking at the other scientific disciplines as well. And that's simply unaffordable. It's unaffordable, frankly, for us here in the developing world, developed world, but it's also unaffordable for people who have really tiny income issues. So, we launched. We had a commitment from the publishers to provide their content for free as partners. We're not paying them anything for it. 
we had free access initially to 68 countries from five publishers, 1,500 journals. As you've seen, that's now grown to 40,000 resources of all types and flavors in over 100 countries. Then we had additional portals created in an agriculture environment, applied sciences, and the graph is way too small for you to see other than this is the line of content going up over the years. So what does this mean for MOOCs? And here's where I start turning this conversation into what is the basis of this particular conference. Higher education in low and middle income countries is an interesting situation. Um, and it's interesting in the standpoint of, from the standpoint that there is an enormously explosive growth in the number of higher education institutions in lower and middle income countries. If we just look at it from the narrow window, we, what we can see in our programs, because institutions will register with us to get the access, we see 2,500 academic institutions are currently registered for our programs. If I skip to the bottom bullet, when we first registered, started the programs, and give it a couple of years for people to become aware and start registering for the access, we had 350 academic institutions registered. Now, some of that differential is simply, again, awareness. It takes a lot of time for people to become aware and start registering for programs. But an enormous amount of that growth is actually new institutions being formed. And we see this all the time. We get registrations from an institution, and they say, our university is just launching this month or our university launched last year and we have become aware of you and we're registering. Or we are in the process of launching a university and we'd like the library to be the first thing that actually has some content at the university and we want to register for your program. So this is a really interesting fact and, and it's interesting from the standpoint of we're all talking about the need for education to happen in these low and middle income settings. So if we were wanting to see that education happen, we want those higher education institutions to exist. We want them to have robust programs. We want them to turn out students that actually have achieved a good education in the process. If we want that, what does it mean if MOOCs exist, and this has been mentioned before at this conference, and suddenly we have education coming from outside the countries? Is there still a place, is there still a niche, is there still a robust environment that these educational institutions can serve? Make sure I'm going in the right direction here. So this was a concern to us when we started receiving requests from organizations offering MOOCs saying, this is great, we are offering MOOCs, we have developing country and st students signing up for them, not a lot, but there are some signing up, and we're assigning course readings and those students can't read the course readings. But we know you're offering information, access to publications that the low and middle income country students can use. We want to tie this together in some fashion. And my uh, initial reaction to that was, we are about making sure that capacity is developed in the low and middle income country world. Our main focus is research capacity or policy development capacity, but it's also about the whole sphere around that. We don't necessarily want to undermine the institutions that are signing up for our programs by also making sure that our content is available to students signing up for outside MOOCs. Um, but then I was rethinking that. Um, obviously, there's a whole range of way that range of ways that institutions in these countries can make use of MOOCs, and some of that discussion has been happening here. So, is there a way that we could look at making available our information to the students that are taking MOOCs and do it through our institutions? So in other words, the students have to be registered at one of our institutions in order to get the access, even if they're taking a MOOC from someplace else. And that's what we're looking at right now. Um, we're looking at working through the institutions who are registering with us, who have gotten the access details that they're sharing with their student body, 
and and that that opens the door to a whole range of other things, which I think at least Mary's going to be talking about, possibly Robert as well. So what are we actually doing? And I'm getting close to the end of my time here, I'm sure. Um, so we have, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> we, we have decided to work initially in a very small sort of test pilot type of a way. There is an organization which is just up the lake from us in Geneva. Um, you heard from a representative of that organization on the first opening panel. EPFL, which stands for École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, which for those of you who are here in the U.S., you can think of as something like the MIT of Switzerland. And they offer their own MOOCs through their own platforms. And they also are working through some of the major MOOC providers like Coursera and edX and things like that. But for the pilot, they want to do something under their own control. So they are saying for the managed, the MOOCs that they manage themselves, they want to include a journal reading button in the course that would allow them to link to our content that's in Research for Life and shunt the students through the route that would have required them to use the access that they have in their home institutions at the same time as not excluding all the students who are taking the course from elsewhere, forcing them up against our firewall, which would then tell them that you're not part of a developing country institution, so therefore you can't have this link and this access. So it's, it's, it's going to require a little bit of bifurcation in what they present, but the goal is, and we all hope it's going to be successful, is it's not going to matter whether you are a student in a, a world where you have, and you can pay for $15 an article, or you have your university that you're affiliated with, or some other organization that you're affiliated with that has the access just through IP recognition or proxy or whatever. You also then have this alternative route where you are a student of the developing world and your institution has the access and you get in because of that access. So if this is all successful, EPLFL then plans to start the discussion with their other providers of MOOCs about using the same techniques, but they'll have worked out the details on their own managed platform and it won't be then a three-way conversation, which is always much more difficult. So, with that, I will bring this to a close um, because I'm sure we'll hear much more interesting things from our other two speakers and then we can have an interesting conversation. And just so that you, if you want more details, there's some flyers sitting on the table oh, here yes. and we can mention it. Okay. So um, I don't know how many demerits you get for bringing a flash drive with a virus on it when you're speaking at a conference, but I already got those. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk today about how we're supporting agricultural research and teaching in the developing world through, um, again, through journal access programs. Um, Agora, Kim already talked a little bit about, but it's the agriculture component of the Research for Life programs. And then TEAL is a Cornell initiative. TEAL stands for the Essential Electronic Agricultural Library, and it's an offline system. I'll talk a little bit about the two programs, a little bit about what we're doing with training and outreach, and then talk a little bit about how all of that relates to MOOCs. So what's TEAL? Um, one of our colleagues from Africa is holding a TEAL set. It, currently is shipped out to institutions on an external hard drive. It's been called a library in a box. And it includes about 275 plus um, key agricultural journals that have been donated by the participating publishers. Cornell develops the software, puts the content on the hard drives, and then it's updated annually with the little flash drive um, that also gets shipped out to the institutions that have TEAL. 
this was established uh, uh, around the same time that uh, Inari was getting started, a little bit earlier, when it was still, um, most of the e-journals were still on CD-ROMs, and it was designed to get around the bandwidth issues, as well as the cost issues in libraries. TEAL is currently used in 375 institutions in 70 countries. We have a similar eligibility um, set of criteria based on, on GNI per capita, and um, TEAL has had a slightly different set of eligibility criteria, but we're moving to um, matching the research for life criteria for um, institutions. So you've heard about Research for Life. I'll just talk a little bit specifically about what Agora is. Um, Agora also covers food, agriculture, a little bit of environmental science, although we have the, the specific Owari environmental science program through um, Research for Life. We also cover related social sciences, so agricultural economics, development sociology, those kinds of fields. Um, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN is the lead agency um, organizing the Agora program, and Cornell's been a founding partner and, and um, partner in crime, I guess, in uh, developing the Agora program and helping to run it since it launched in 2003. And of the um, content that Kim described, Agora includes about 5,000 journals and about 4,000 ebooks and we're working with Agora in 106 countries. Both of these programs have the same basic goals, along with Hinari and, and the other programs. We're looking at trying to increase the quality of research. Um, anyone who's tried to do research without access to a research library knows how hard that can be and how easy it can be to do research that's already been done. If you can't do a lit review before you're doing your research, you've got a big problem. And with the three journals that were in the libraries, clearly it was a problem. Trying to improve training for new scientists, improve graduate and undergraduate education. In the case of agriculture, um, we're also trying to improve extension programs. And then the, the real long-term goal of this is to improve food security in food deficit countries. Now, it, it's a long way from putting a teal set in an institution to proving that you've actually made a difference at the food security level. But uh, we, you know, to get data to show that is very difficult. But we have a number of case studies, some of which are in the brochure up here, that, that show that the scientists are doing work that does move down to the farm level. So I'm just going to talk a minute here about that, that impact chain and, um, and how it does connect from the research literature down to better lives for the rural poor. And that's not too small up there. If you go down through the middle column, you can see what's happening in a research cycle. You've got research activity. You've got scientists with a, a project creating a research finding, which then gets published in a paper, and the paper is then distributed. Papers have to be read and internalized. The knowledge applied, the technology actually used in farm fields, which ultimately leads to lower costs, higher production, and better health and nutrition. That, that's a long process. And we certainly aren't working in that whole sector segment, but if you look at the highlighted section, that's really where Teal and Agora and Research for Life are trying to make a difference. So especially in the distribution aspects, we're trying to get the material out there, whether it's online or in the case of Teal, offline. Training has been a huge part of this. You can't just put Teal in a library or sign someone up for Hinari and expect that it's magically going to get used. So we've done a lot of training out in the institutions, and I'll show you the best trainer in the world is that man right there, whose name is Gratian Chimwaza. And Gratian works for an organization called ITOCA, 
which he founded. Um, Itoka was uh, originally Gratian and a suitcase, and uh, he was the Teal Africa office starting in 1998, out trying to get Teal into the institutions in Africa. And now he's a small NGO be based in South Africa with about 10 staff and offices in several other countries in Africa. So Itoka is a real success story. Um, Itoka organizes the training throughout Africa, and we've worked on a train-the-trainer model. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And we're also trying a new model of national leadership institutions, where we're targeting specific successful institutions that can lead training in, a, um, in an area. So our original training model, we, we've had funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for TEAL and the training, the outreach um, and training programs. So we did these national level e-resources train the trainer workshops in 14 focus countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And we would invite one to two librarians, faculty, IT staff from each institution to a national level training workshop. And then they would go back, and the expectation was that the two people who were trained would train other people. We trained them how to use the system, but we also trained them how to teach other people how to use the system. And that worked. It led to training in some of the institutions, but invariably the person who was trained would leave, and or they were told they couldn't do any training, or in some cases it just didn't work. So our new model, we're looking at this national leadership institution model where we're training 35 people in each of the institutions that we're working with. And we're hoping to build a critical mass of people who can put forward these ideas of building information literacy into the curriculum and into the um, other training programs and act as um, uh, ambassadors in, the, in their own institution. And then those um, national leadership institutions will also be training neighbor institutions. The incentive for doing that is with our funding from the Gates Foundation, we're able to um, place their TEAL set without them having to pay for it. TEAL has had a chargeback mechanism simply to cover the cost of producing the, the TEAL set. So in the last 12 years, we've learned a lot about capacity building and training, and I think some of what we've learned probably applies in the MOOCs setting as they're getting off the ground in the developing world. Um, I already mentioned that you can't just put a teal set in an institution and expect that people are going to run and use it. Without training, things just really don't happen. Um, the training of the, the train the trainer model is viable. It needs um, fine-tuning, probably, and it, it also works well if you combine it with online training as well and access to online training materials. Creating a community of trainers also helps. Um, trying to get buy-in from administration and policymakers, we often will invite key people to open the workshops that we have. So. The vice chancellor will come and open the workshop. Sometimes someone from the Ministry of Agriculture will come and open the workshop, Ministry of Health. So we, we try to create a, a buzz around the training. Um, like everyone has been saying, you can't work in silos. You have to work in partnership with local institutions and in whatever configuration that an institution sits in, you have to find your way through that and then increased investment in training. Professional training is really key. So the last thing I'll talk about here in this context is um, a more general comment on libraries and their potential role in the MOOC environment. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, libraries have a history of supporting self-directed learning. If you imagine the New York Public Library or the Boston Li Public Library. Is it the Philadelphia Free Library here in Philadelphia? They were founded on the principle that individuals had the right to learn and could come into a public library and 
borrow materials and read. I actually live in a tiny town in upstate New York, and the name of our library is the best. It's called the Ulysses Philomathic Library. <laughs> and um, for those of you who don't know what philomathic means, I had to look it up when I moved there. Philomathic means love of learning. So even in a little town in upstate New York, there's the love of learning at the public library. So um, it fits with the MOOC um, philosophy, I think. We have um, a tradition of shared learning in libraries with book clubs and community programs. Um, academic libraries are um, looking at shared collaborative space with enhanced technology so that students can do group projects. Um, we also have an understanding of copyright and permissions issues, which are a huge issue within the MOOC context. Kim talked a lot about supplemental library resources and how they fit with the MOOC environment. A lot of MOOCs are a self-contained set of resources, but if you can pull from outside material to enhance that, especially in a blended learning environment where you're using the MOOC to teach a class in a different institution, having access to the resources enhances what you're able to do. Um, libraries provide access to technology for students who don't have their own, and they also have access to knowledgeable staff. So I can picture uh, a scenario where a library might host a MOOC where people could come and look at the videos in a library setting and then continue to use the technology in the library to enhance their learning. So just some thoughts on the roles libraries can play um, and how it fits with what we've been doing um, for a long time. And with that, I've got my links to all the programs that I just talked about. Um, and I think these PowerPoints are going to be available. So if you need those links, they'll, they'll be up somewhere. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rob Cronin um, and uh, I come from an organization called IREX. Normally we just leave that as an acronym, uh, but for an academic community, I guess I can explain it's the International Research and Exchanges Board. Um, and we come from academic roots, although we now do quite a bit of other civil society and development uh, projects, and that, that's kind of the perspective I'll come, come from in this, this debate and this discussion, very developmental uh, perspective. Um, the uh, I, I could make a metaphor for the picture and about how that's the future generation and, and, and really? about consumption of information. Uh, it's really just a gratuitous shout of my daughter, uh, Sadie, to create favor from, from the audience. I generally, generally find it's a useful way to start. Uh, um, the, uh, but, but we'll quickly get into our angle on uh, MOOCs for development, but want to uh, first give a few words explaining uh, what IREX is. Um, we were, as I mentioned, we're an academic organization. We were founded in 1968. Uh, if uh, you're familiar with Fulbright Scholarship, the, the academic scholarship for the uh, Soviet Union and, and Eastern Bloc uh, countries was the IREX, meaning we were an uh, intermediary NGO that was created to help facilitate uh, collaborative scholarship and communication between the uh, Soviet Union and, and the United States. Um, 
and that's that's very much our roots uh, in educational setting. But since then, we've we uh, broadened to do a lot of uh, independent media programs with uh, funding from uh, State Department and USAID, as well as civil society and and uh, technology. Active in, in more than a hundred uh, more than hundred countries uh, worldwide. Um, I wear two hats. Uh, I'm vice president generally for programming, but also I'm the director uh, of the Center for Collaborative Technologies. Uh, what that is is a sort of an autonomous unit within IREX that helps promote best practices in technology and as well as a number of tech for development uh, projects worldwide. Uh, the, the, it, it's a, variety, a mix of very small uh, programs around Gender, gender technology, technology for development, and then a, and a very large project in collaboration with the Gates program around uh, libraries and uh, libraries develop, development. The theme that goes through all of those, though, and important for this debate, uh, is that we're very much about uh, low-tech approaches to tech for development and an understanding of the limitations in developing countries uh, around uh, tech for development in general, but also obviously uh, MOOCs and for this uh, discussion. And I'll talk a lot about that uh, further further down. Um, the uh, um, but but quickly to set up that discussion, I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about uh, RX uh, history within uh, technology and sort of our approach uh, to technology. As I mentioned, we're, we're very much about a low bandwidth approach uh, because we believe you've got to be realistic. Um, you've heard uh, there's a lot of uh, data points that are out there about how pervasive and quickly expanding uh, bandwidth and access is in the developing world. Uh, there's, there's one I heard at the conference actually just last week about pretty soon there's going to be more uh, mobile phones out in the world than there are people on the planet. Um, as a way of showing that mobile phones are the future and, and, and that's going to be the, the, the prospect for access. But there's other data points that have to go along with that, uh, is that while there may be as many mobile phones out there uh, in the world as there are people, uh, penetration of internet access in the developing world is only 40%. Uh, another figure is that women are 20% uh, less likely to have access to technology uh, than men. Um, and, and also just uh, it kind of that, that data point also uh, gets at me because it kind of in a lot of ways misunderstands how mobile phones are used in the world in a developing country uh, I was just recently in Afghanistan where you need three to four phones uh, not to mention a number of SIM cards uh, to be able to access the different mobile network uh, systems um, and that it, it's simplifying it to say that, that, that there's a mountain of phones out there, and, and that's to take that point uh, a step further, uh, is the approach that we have uh, to tech for development that unless there's a very sort of keen understanding of the priorities of your local partners, um, as well as an understanding of the just access challenges that uh, they run into, there's a danger that a lot of these technical solutions are out there but not accessed. Um, and that uh, for us, uh, public access is an overwhelming uh, priority. Um, we, uh, for a long time, uh, IREX ran a network of telecenters, about 250 uh, tele telecenters across uh, uh, the former Soviet Union. And from that, uh, we learned a lot. Uh, we started you know, with a, a bunch of simple uh, distance learning projects. Um, and, and then quickly learned that uh, unless people had on the ground person-to-person -person connections, uh, unless there was follow-up uh, from universities uh, with individual learners, that, that it significantly uh, sort of impacted on the, the penetration of the information and the effectiveness uh, of the, the learning. Um, and, and, and part of that is something that we believe passionately in, is that uh, from that experience running uh, telecenters was an idea that if you just cabled enough institutions that people would get access and that would democratize uh, learning, that would democratize access to information. Uh, and what we learned was 
the danger was just the opposite, is that as, as you heard this morning and a couple other speakers, uh, the gentleman from India as well as from China, uh, that the access to internet is as capable of increasing disparity uh, as it is in providing equity. Um, and that's in, in, important to recognize that the digital divide is not, uh, the gap between uh, the elites and the developing world is not closing, but uh, instead increasing. Um, and so the model that we uh, uh, fundamentally believe in uh, is an idea of broadening public access. Uh, Beyond Access is a project we run uh, in collaboration with the Gates Foundation. Uh, it's fundamentally about the idea uh, that's been mentioned a couple of times, and, and Mary teed up uh, my, my conversation quite a bit in saying and talking about uh, the role of libraries as a public uh, institution in access. Um, that there are just fundamental advantages uh, to the role of libraries uh, in providing public access. Uh, it's a safe space uh, for learning, it's sustainable, it's got uh, government budgets that help uh, uh, make it a useful partner for both developmental and academic initiatives. Um, and we uh, work on a, uh, um, the idea that wherever we go, we not only uh, uh, run into the, the stereotype that you know, libraries are an anachronism, uh, that, that phone, uh, phones are the future of access to information, um, but there's a lack of uh, understanding the power of the infrastructure of libraries in developing countries. There are uh, 230,000 libraries in the developing world, more than uh, uh, the number of health uh, met, uh, hospitals and uh, medical clinics. Um, the, there's actually more libraries in the developing world than there are in the uh, developed world. Um, and so the, the idea that we uh, believe uh, passionate about is the role that uh, libraries can do in this, this discussion of uh, discussion of MOOCs. Um, we're part of a coalition. Um, the important one down at the bottom is Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is our primary uh, donor, but a number of also powerful uh, institutions that are, are proponents of libraries, uh, IFLA, IFL, and, and others that you may uh, be familiar with. Um, to convey this discussion uh, about libraries uh, more directly to uh, MOOCs, um, there's a number of key aspects of approaches which, which uh, from a pr practitioner's perspective, from an organization that works on the ground, um, that we, we believe that uh, there has to be an integrated approach. There was, uh, in this morning's discussion, uh, a talk about uh, whether or not uh, you know a MOOC was really a MOOC if it was working out of local universities or if it involved connections to local courses. What we see on the ground is the danger that uh, MOOCs uh, limit the space uh, uh, for local universities, and so therefore are big advocates and big proponents of integrated approaches uh, uh, to MOOCs. Uh, if, topic of conversation is MOOCs for development, it implies a starting point of development um, and development pri priorities. Um, I've, I've mentioned the role that libraries can play in that, uh, but would also uh, you know, give examples from uh, local universities. Uh, we recently did uh, a workshop on MOOCs in Washington, D.C. that involved uh, a man by the name of Carlos Martinez, who's from El, Sa El Salvador, who Skyped in. Uh, and made a, a, what I thought was a critical point in saying that the value of a MOOC for him in El Salvador uh, is not so much uh, the access uh, to the courses, but as a redistribution of resources from rich universities to poor universities. And what he meant by that is as uh, an engineer teaching courses in El Salvador, uh, the value was that he could get access to collateral material, to coursework, to problem sets, uh, from the websites uh, to improve his teaching, that he used the MOOCs to provide materials for his own teaching. 
um, and that it was as valuable for that as anything else. And it emphasizes the point of MOOCs starting from partnerships uh, with local universities and the idea of enhancing local universities, empowering local universities, enabling uh, local universities, uh, as opposed to just coming in with a, with a, a Western brand of, of academic uh, credentials. Um, and the, the other thing is also just to encourage in this discussion uh, a focus on innovative local approaches to how you deliver knowledge. Uh, it sounds strange to uh, be referencing community radio, radios or CDs, but uh, I mentioned Afghanistan uh, and being there, and, and some of the more innovative and effective uh, learning that goes on in its sort of uh, remote format is by distributing coursework through CDs and then having uh, community radio stations uh, broadcast uh, a lot of the lecture lecture work um, and having it reinforce it as far as, far as um, doing uh, achieving the objectives of MOOCs but using uh, innovative low-tech uh, alternatives that can help do that. Um, but the last point I want to mention, and then, then I'll wrap up, um, is the issue of uh, accreditation and credentials. Um, and it, it sounds uh, a little simplistic to talk about badges and certificates, but as an organization, IREX, that's been working with local universities and local academics for 40 years, uh, just to not underestimate the issue that, on the one hand, accreditation is extraordinarily hard to do, uh, with local ministries of education and local universities, but on the uh, at the same that uh, there needs to be a system of credentializing uh, horrible word, uh, but providing some sort of uh, certificate or badges that, that gives uh, substance to learning that, that folks do, um, and thinking about that also uh, creatively, um, and that uh, organizations like. Uh, Cisco and Mozilla are doing a lot of interesting things in, in providing uh, badges and certificates and that there's a lot of lessons to be learned about how you give participants in online learning and participants in MOOCs some sort of uh, credential that they can use when they, they're using it for professional development and, and, and furthering their uh, professional career. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. Thank you. We, we started a little late, so maybe we you know, have like 20 minutes um, for questions. I know we have a lot of expertise um, in the audience, and I hope you'll be willing to share that. But I wanted to call on my former colleague, Ann Seymour, um, who is associate uh, director in the, the biomed libraries here at the University of Pennsylvania, has recently left us to go to Johns Hopkins, where she's the director. Because um, Ann was really Penn Library's great ambassador and best uh, representative partnering um, with Penn's faculty, and particularly our program in Botswana and then subsequently in, in Guatemala. And Ann, I wonder if you could just like quickly, I think it's such an interesting trajectory over the years of starting with um, a library assessment. Uh, in the, at the University of Botswana, and how that developed into, you know, solutions in the field, partnering with faculty, and so forth. So maybe Anne can say a word. Sure. <laughs> Hi, it's great to be back. I'll stand up. Oops. Sorry. Um, it's great to be back here at Penn. I've only been in Hopkins for a few months, so this still feels like home. Um, so. Back in 2008, we were granted an award from the Elsevier Foundation, who is represented here by Alain Michem, um, and to do an assessment of information needs assessment in Botswana. Um, Penn has a strong program in Botswana, but there was no linkage between the library here at Penn and the library at the University of Botswana, and so. We did a needs assessment, and it was also at a really critical juncture in at the university and for the country because of their immense uh, health crisis, the highest AIDS, HIV rate in the world at the time. 
and they had no medical school, and they were about to launch a new medical school, and the library really had no idea of how to, they didn't have experience in supporting academic medicine or clinical medicine, so it was a really amazing time to go and assess needs and figure out how how we could be involved with supporting those needs. And um, obviously, access to information was really critical in launching a medical school and supporting clinicians in a country that has a huge health crisis plus a very um, much of the population uh, in rural areas. And so one of the things that came out of it was the idea of mobile technology. And I totally agree with Rob's points about, oh, this is great, let's do it, but you really have to assess what's available, how the technology works, who has it. I will say that one of the projects that I became involved with was um, distributing smartphones to residents in, in this new medical program. And because they didn't have any old infrastructure that supported um, information needs, they had no textbooks, no journals, nothing in libraries in these clinical settings, let alone a big infrastructure in the university library. Um, and so these smartphones that we distributed with content loaded on them, um, as to quote one resident, was a lifeline to them. They used smartphones to read the literature. And it, it, because a lot of it was um, locally loaded on the device, they didn't need high bandwidth or a lot of technology. And then when they did need it, they could use it to connect and download more content. But it was, it was so fascinating that this phone, that they were at home re you know, reading textbooks on a phone, which is really interesting. Um, sorry. I could talk for <laughs> length about this. So. Um, one other comment that I wanted to, to make, I don't know if anybody is here who is connected with UNESCO, um, but I had conversations with Banu Nupain, um, who was unable to come to the conference, uh, but he's the program specialist who is taking responsibility for open access strategies um, through UNESCO. And he had, we've been, you know, exchanging email correspondence, and um, he has told me that the post-2015 development agenda um, for UNESCO may include open access as a possible indicator of development in science, technology, and innovative um, processes. So I think one of my questions to the audience and also to the panelists um, you know, if that moves towards becoming a reality, how does it affect, um, you know, programs in place? How does it expand opportunities um, for creating local repositories mm -hmm. of scholarly information? So maybe we can also have a conversation around that. Um, comments, questions, enhancements? <laughs> yeah. Great. So Nicole Allen from Spark. Um, we work on promoting uh, a more open system of scholarly communication and work on um, open access research and open educational resources. Um, and of course, you know the work that you all are doing to expand access to traditionally published journals is so important um, for addressing needs right now. Um, our work focuses on making sure that when research is published, that it's published in a way that allows people to fully use it. So not just making it available free online, but also coupling that with the rights to use it. So releasing it under an open copyright license that grants users the, the right to actually um, you know, download a copy and keep that copy, freely share it, and to reuse it um, by breaking it down. Um, so I'm curious, uh, just for your respective projects, what role has open access journals played in any of the work you do? Have you been including open access journals um, on the, you know, the hard drives or in your repositories? Um, and where do you see that going in the future? Um, so one of the concerns that was actually raised when the programs all got started in 2001, 2002 was 
would opening up, it's, it's like what we're talking about here at this MOOC conference, would opening up the traditionally northern published global scientific literature then squelch the local journals, the locally published materials, etc. And we've actually seen somewhat the reverse of that. Um, we have now enormous waves of uh, publishing, local publishing that are publishing open access who come to us and say we want our journals listed alongside The Lancet and Science and Nature and all of these other major scientific publications because the content is useful in our settings. And we absolutely agree and it gives us a way of highlighting and showing and sharing that information. So we do list it, we're not an index. We are simply a browsable list of people who can find the content. Um, and we see it growing in, in huge leaps and bounds. We see the open access content of the developing world itself growing. And it's, it's wonderful. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity for the authors, and it's a wonderful opportunity of readers around the world. I can comment from a teal perspective. Um, for a long time, the, the CD-ROM format of Teal limited the amount of material we could distribute. And the big issue that we're trying to address is the, the barrier because of bandwidth. And so now that we aren't as limited by the size of the system and the storage capabilities, we're starting to add more open access content to the Teal database. Um, We've been talking with the Indian Council on Agricultural Research about their, their content is open on, a, on an open site that they run themselves, and they're going to be contributing some of that content. And then you're making the transfer from an Indian agricultural ecosystem, which is very comparable to, in some places, an African system. So we think that addition of literature is going to be really useful. So that's just one example of open content from the developing world that we're putting on Teal so that more people can get to it. South-South. South-South. Yeah. No, uh, yes. Yeah, I just have a question. Kimberly, can you um, elaborate a bit on this pilot? Uh, between PFL and Research for Life, are you talking about working with an institution um, in Africa, say, and then doing some sort of closed MOOC? How can we envision this? Because it was <laughs> love was to hear closed. more. <laughs> okay, um, we're actually not talking about picking out specific institutions in our countries of Research for Life, although Mary might have something to say about that in a second. Um, what EPFL is looking at is, from their perspective, they offer a course. Anyone in the world can sign up for that course. They want to make sure that the students in the countries where we work can read additional materials. So they're wanting to make sure that they have ways of providing links to those additional reading materials that will work for people who are anywhere in the world and have paid subscriptions or whatever, as well as students in our countries and institutions, so that it will work through our gateway system, if you want to think of it that way. But my understanding is that most MOOCs use material that is open access and freely available. But not always. Okay. Um, some universities that are offering MOOCs will actually negotiate the rights or to, uh, to offer the material through their courses. And I don't know, you may have people at Cornell managing those rights things. It's a huge headache. And it's also a huge headache for the publishers. Um, because what do you charge for that, if you're going to charge? But if you, you know, sort of leave that out of the picture, there's supplementary readings that may not be part of what you standardly arranged to be offered as course readings in the course. And it's those things that maybe you offer supplementary link readings that then some people can read and some people can't, and that's unfair. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, we have a follow-up question. Just follow up question to that. So if, if I understand correctly, Kimberly, um, that to uh, the students, MOOCs, MOOC students, MOOC learners who are not enrolled in uh, the Ecole uh courses, um, uh, uh, research for uh, research for life is is providing alternative 
uh, reading materials or links to the uh, medical and scientific journals that you said for ones that are not registered for the EPFL courses, the we'll pilot is with you. We'll register, we're not enrolled in the, um, we're not students of the Ecole mm -hmm. Clinique. Yeah, so they're offering MOOCs Outside. which are open. Yes. And so anyone in the world can sign up for yeah. them. And then it's a matter of outside of the Ecole Polytechnique and their subscriptions for their students, etc. How do those students get access? And if they're if they're in the north, we're going to assume right. that they have access to some institution that can get them the information. And it's in our countries then the students right. who are associated with our institutions getting them the access and working through the channels we already have open for the institutions in our countries. So the big problem is if you have no affiliation. Yeah. If you have no affiliation, then it's then, then what happens? Well, but but the, the, the goal is, one of the reasons that we had some concerns to start with, is we want the students to be affiliated, to be registered somehow with the institutions in the developing world. If they're in our, our countries, hopefully they can register with one of those institutions as a student. And then they are affiliated and can get the access. And that strengthens those institutions of higher education, too. Yeah, but so, so in other words, there are really no provisions for um, students who are not registered with those institutions. Right, and okay, that's, yeah. that's all I want. It's got pros and cons to find a home, a home based institution to, right. to register. Although public libraries can yeah. buy teal or register for an RE, right? Yes, there's some there's some barriers there, but it, it is possible. Quick follow up, yeah. If that's okay. um, I, I just wanted to ask if in the pilot there's any um, effort to identify open access content, uh, not free but open access um, that would be, because uh, permissions aren't an issue, it would be right. available to anybody yeah. in the world. Um, have they been working to try to identify alternative readings to that? Um, well, that's already what they're doing. Okay. So this is then, you know, they, they've already taken that step and they still have barriers, so they're trying to open up those barriers. Okay. 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 Well, just to reinforce Mary's point that uh, uh, sort of using libraries as a kind of conduit of that information is a great way to create the alternative channel, which you seem to be asking about. Uh, I could mention from Penn Library's experience, we were first drawn into helping with the books at the university in order to clear rights for third party materials that were being used by our, our faculty. I think Penn launched with 13 courses um, all at once and it was a complete scramble to try and work with publishers um, to get the rights. None of them at that point really had any experience of this. But most of it was not really, it was not for supplemental readings. It was for use of, of images that were appearing um, in uh, you know, lecture presentations. And um, it put the scholarly communication group in kind of a, you know, an interesting new position. And I guess we've tried to leverage it to have conversations then um, with faculty about how teaching through a MOOC, particularly in Penn's case, Coursera, where Penn is a financial investor, it has a different set of um, regulations and copyright and IP considerations than, you know, if you're teaching in a closed classroom where you're authenticating through a library management um, system to get access to material. And then it allowed us to open up a conversation, too, about looking for alternatives. So we have developed a number of guides to um, open access um, images. We're doing one on text, probably a new one on OERs. And we're also reminding people if you used our scholarly commons and <coughs> deposited your scholarship there, it would be available to the world. And much more quickly, we, we wouldn't have to do any clearing of rights. <laughs> you can just go there and, and get it. Um, but there has not been a lot of integration of readings. And it's kind of a mystery to me of how the teaching end courses can go on. Um, with all relying just on supplemental um, readings to, to scholarly literature. Other questions for our panelists? Or, yeah, um, James. <laughs> uh, James <laughs> Simons, Center for Research Libraries. This has been extremely interesting to me because 
you know, when we're talking about the subject is infrastructure, which implies fixed boundaries, you know, and, and supporting libraries and, and the infrastructure on the ground to, to support these things is to some extent at odds with this concept of you know purely open, purely massive MOOCs. Um, I, I am a similar proponent as you uh, to the idea that libraries are an excellent channel for empowerment. Um, you know, it just it strikes me that when we have to think about the, the fixed boundaries of, of infrastructure, um, the Internet Archive is always an interesting example that comes up. It's something that they're doing recently that doesn't apply to MOOCs per se, but um, they're using it in the context of text mining, is they're using material that is not in the public domain, that is they're respecting some of the copyright issues by creating virtual reading rooms uh, where they store the materials on their site. You can apply algorithms using the sort of virtual interface to some materials, so you're not taking and downloading the, the materials, it's sort of stored in a um, fixed space, but you can access it and use it. And that's something that we might want to consider as a potential model or even a potential partner in making some of this otherwise locked down content accessible to a broader audience. Yeah, there are a number of interesting sort of models around that, and it also is uh, critical for uh, the bandwidth issue. And just the, the, you can't underestimate the obstacle uh, cost of this bandwidth uh, in developing countries, whether it's phone or, or uh, internet, and in, in mirrored sites or uh, sort of systematically downloading in static sites are incredibly helpful. And I, I don't know if that's part of what you're seeing, but. Uh, it, it helps address some of the management questions. I think, um, Yeah, uh, Rory McGrail at the Basque University. Um, uh, how much do you, um, how much advantage do you take of your fair use rights in, 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 in this? Because uh, it seems to me that if you have the students have to enter a space, I don't believe you could put somebody else's content on the open internet. But if you have it behind a fire, firewall or, or a password, and it's there, and then these students have to go in there, um, then your fair use rights, you can use uh, uh, images for educational purposes, you can use uh, uh, one or two articles from different uh, uh, um, scholarly journals, uh, um, there's a wide range of things that can be done, and you have every legal right to do that. In so, the United States. In the United States, you do. And we're talking worldwide here. <laughs> but they're they're accessing it in the United States. But they're accessing it from whatever country they're in. Right. It's an interesting challenge. But it, it's cool. But and well, I can say that in in the common law countries that are the British uh, English speaking world. Um, the law is pretty standard, and they have fair dealing, um, which is probably at the moment, because of a recent <coughs> Canadian Supreme Court decision, uh, much more liberal than the American fair use. So um, you have a, you do have a problem. However, I would think in uh, the Napoleonic Code, the uh, European ones, and some Asian ones. Yeah, at, at Penn, it's been somewhat of a challenge for us. We would like to invoke um, fair use, but because Penn is also a financial investor in Coursera, um, and we feel also like we could be a target because we're a very visible, prominent um, university, we've really had to emphasize with the faculty the transformative use factor in, in fair use, that that absolutely you know, needs to um, to be present. It has to be critical. We can't just use things, um, you know, because they somehow uh, make it more delightful experience. It has to go beyond being a delightful experience, unfortunately, <laughs> to um, to to being transformative in in some way. Um, but again, that's particular choices and situation at, at Penn. It's not. It's true of all all platforms or other other partners. <coughs> yeah, um, you mentioned the Spirit Foundation. I have a question for, for Robert. If you could elaborate a bit on this idea of an integrated MOOC to get away from this one-way consumption model. I, I don't know if you have examples of that. How can we envision that? People hear the question about an integrated MOOC and getting away from the, the one-way model. 
Yeah, I mean, primarily what I have in mind is local partnerships. And local partnerships are a lot of different sort of elements of the, uh, the chain. Um, it's uh, partnerships with local universities so that the objective, I mean, I mentioned like uh, an interest in emphasizing the developmental perspective is that uh, I, I don't uh, uh, see, and it's obviously there's, there's logistical administrative obstacles to it, but that the MOOCs uh, developing local partners with local universities um, so that there's a combination of online resources and it's connected, integrated with their curriculum. Um, and that there's, it's supporting local research. There's huge silos uh, between, uh, obviously, you know, that's what my partners are talking about, huge silos between Western <coughs> research and local research, uh, and anything that can fil to facilitate the flow of information that can strengthen local scholarship. Uh, it's also um, teaching uh, in partnership with libraries, as I mentioned, uh, which is uh, allowing the libraries to be sort of their mission of public access to information be reinforced by broader access to the journals, um, uh, as well as uh, part of the coursework being administered in partnership with libraries. In other words, have the libraries be learning centers um, in which people can come and get free access to a lot of this coursework. Um, and then lastly, uh, on the topic of partnership, um, would mention governments and, and the it sounds like maybe a strange thing uh, to mention and it, it came up in the, this morning session um, but for us in our uh, mission of promoting online access learning and, and public access we rely heavily on the fact that developing countries uh, almost all of them have some agenda around uh, the inclusion or uh, social inclusion or not falling around uh, behind te technologically, that they might not be pro proponents of uh, open access or public access to the media. Um, you know, as in Istanbul, and they just recently shut down Twitter uh, and YouTube. But they do have mandates for e government, they do have mandates for uh, social inclusion around uh, propagating technology, and that there's room to leverage. The government mandate to provide open access to technology and use that then to facilitate what the libraries want to do, what the universities want to do, even around uh, the WISIS uh, MDG open uh, access to information as a human right. Uh, part of the reason uh, WISIS and, and, and the UN has been successful in opening a conversation around information as a right is that um, it's it's connect being sort of tied to uh, international developing countries wanting to not fall behind technologically. So they're interested in computers, they're interested in the bandwidth, they're interested in the backbone, uh, and this is a, uh, as a consequence you can get a lot of other access issues in it. Great, well I hope you'll join me in thanking our, our panel.